Ian's year is divided between recording and doing live performances on tour. Living out of a suitcase and doing over 70 performances in a single tour could be physically punishing for someone who is fully fit. I asked Ian how he organised himself while touring and what kind of support he needed. On the road, I do have help. I've got uh, my right-hand man, who's in fact the band's right-hand man. He does things for everybody. It's a general personal manager kind of affair. And he helps me a lot. I mean, I literally couldn't carry a hundred-weight suitcase. I just couldn't do it. And so there's a certain amount of that goes on. But I, I brush my own teeth on the road. You know? It's not as if I'm totally helpless or anything. When you first got up, though, or first decided you were going to perform, did you feel embarrassed? Did you feel self-conscious? No, not at all. No. I'd, I'd be more embarrassed about my voice than my bad leg. I was at the time, I remember. No, because I've always been fairly flash. And I was more flash before I was well known. I mean, nowadays, if I go out in the street, I get recognised because of the way I walk. People look at cripples walking down the street because they're visually more exotic than most people, and it's just in their perambulation method. And now I dress a bit quietly compared to how I used to dress just because I get embarrassed by meeting hundreds of people. But 10 years ago, 15 years ago, I was an extremely noisy person out in the street. I, I didn't wave it about. I, I've seen people waving their disabilities about. I don't think you should do that. Roger Daltrey once, we, the Kilburns did a tour with The Who, and Roger, the singer with The Who, said, Listen here, mate, if I had a bad leg like that, I'd be out there, I'd really make the most of it. And, I mean, he was being nice and talking showbiz to me, but he didn't realise that the way I was flash was the opposite way around to that. Almost, not to pretend I didn't have a bad leg, but really just to completely ignore it and allow my natural grace to come through, notwithstanding. Or falling, not with falling over. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think it gave you more of a need to perform? Yeah, probably. Compensate me again. But that would be the, um, what you might call the, the psychological cross one must bear, is that you know that you are compensating for something. Being flesh probably is one of the problems that you get when you're different from everybody else. Being noisy, trying to be the centre of attention, maybe to divert attention away from yourself in a funny kind of way. In a way, I think one thing you learn is that we're all, in some way or other, not perfect or disabled, if you like. I've known people with, for instance, men who are going bald, who really do suffer full tilt. It's partly imaginary and it's partly real, from the hair falling out. And so they suffer so much, much, much more than I've ever actually suffered from a kind of embarrassment about facing the world. Oh, God, I can't go out with my ridge showing. Or they run and they hold their big flap of hair down. In a way, I think everybody's got a hang-up of some sort. And perhaps if it's if it's a bright blue one, it's something you're forced to contend with fairly early on once you've recognised it. I mean, my hang-ups as a, as a normal person are much more dangerous to me than any polio hang-ups. My just my worries about my own character and soul, you know, whatever my laziness or whatever, those kind of things worry me much more. On stage, I just try and look for the good. I feel very graceful. I feel like New York when I'm on stage. I don't feel like Dumbo the Elephant or anything. A guy wrote to me a couple of years ago from Wandsworth, and he runs a housing association called SHAD, Sheltered Homes for the Disabled. And he typed me a letter. I think it must have been a one-finger job. Describing his daily round to me. And he has gets through the day with the, the aid of six voluntary helpers. They even have to wipe his bum when he's out of put. Um... And he's arranged six more houses, and he's got a house from Wandsworth Council, holds down a full-time job, and organises this thing, where six other very disabled people have got houses. And last year we played in Islington at Sobel Centre, just before Christmas, and a, a guy came up in a wheelchair, somebody brought him up, he couldn't do it himself. And he was so severely spastic, at least I think he was a spastic, I, I don't know the definition of his illness, but it was one where he was, was very folded up and he couldn't move at all. They couldn't speak. And I, I've learned that language over the years. And I can't, could understand it, even though he had a Glaswegian accent as well, it made it very difficult. And I knew that nobody else in the room could understand him in the dressing room, this was before the gig. And he said to me that he'd got an honours degree from Cambridge in something or other, and that his difficulty was that nobody could understand anything about him at all. And nobody at all, except they had to learn it, would know that that guy was anything more than a cabbage. And that guy, I think he really has it hard, you know, really hard.
And for me to compare myself with him, well, um, makes me look a bit silly, doesn't it? Ian Dury is a classic example of someone who, by positive thinking and sheer guts, has not only coped with his physical handicap, but has also succeeded in one of the most competitive of worlds. In coming to terms with this handicap, he seems to have developed an extraordinary mental strength. But even so, I wondered whether now, if there were moments when he felt bitter about the accident of fate, which had made him physically handicapped to start with. I felt kind of anger in the last couple of years, uh, a sense of, I suppose, regret that I didn't do more, that I hadn't done more, because I got very tired on the road doing it. We did so many full concerts in a row, I think it was. I got very exhausted, and I went away, and I met a doctor It was out in Africa. He steamed into me, this doctor. said, well, you're not doing as much as you could, are you? And really told me about being physically active, which I, more or less, I thought I was physically active, but I'd been on the road, but in fact, I wasn't as active as I should have been. And he said there's exercises and there's all kinds of... Like, for instance, if you've got a healthy chest and you get your chest really, really healthy and really exercise, that will that'll flow right down the parts of you that aren't healthy. That kind of uh, idea that goodness will spread and work on what is good and it will affect the other things. And that led me to a certain sense of regret about my sloth rather than...